Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second Target Sheet webinar of 2020 presented by Verbac. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name's Alex, and I'm the product manager for the Sheet Parasiticides range at Verbac, and I'll be your moderator for this evening's webinar once again. Um, so we have the pleasure, once again, of having Dr. Tim Elliott and Dr. George Fox on board to present on the importance of quarantine drenching. Uh, a bit of housekeeping before we do get into it. Um, you should be able to hear us. We cannot hear you. If you are having technical issues, please call or text the number on your screen and I'll do my best to help you out. Uh, if you do have any questions for Tim or George, please type them into the question box provided and uh, we'll get to them as soon as we can. There you go, it's right there on your screen. Um, please be as clear as possible when asking questions so that we can give you the best possible answers. Uh, so getting back into it, as I said, tonight we are joined by Dr. Tim Elliott. Um, Tim is a researcher with a particular interest in production animal uh, parasitology and drug resistance. Uh, Tim has worked with many pharmaceutical companies, universities, veterinarians and government departments to help reduce the impact of parasites on animal production. Uh, he has experience in experiences designing uh, parasite control programs for sheep farmers in the New England region of New South Wales where germ resistance is highly prevalent, um, especially right now. Uh, following the rain that the region has you know, finally received in the last few weeks, which is fantastic. Uh, Tim completed his PhD at La Trobe University, uh, studying the prevalence of liver fluke in the Gippsland dairy region of Victoria. Uh, and Tim's work has been published in internationally renowned journals and has presented his work all around Australia for scientific audiences and pharma groups. Uh, now, before we get into it, um, we do have a few poll questions to go through. Uh, these poll questions uh, help us get a better understanding of who you are, uh, and what information would be most beneficial for you. And they do um, tailor Tim's uh, presentation style as well. So they are anonym anonymous, um, so please be as honest as you can with your response. So the first question is standard from us and you should see it pop up on your screen now. It's a simple one, which state are you from? I'll close that one in three, two, and one. All right, guys, and there you should be able to see the responses on your screen. Um, so quite a few from Queensland and Northern Territories, as well as uh, Victoria and Tasmania. Uh, very different to the last one we ran, where I think the um, majority of the audience were from New South Wales and ACT. So different demographic or geographic, which is, which is great. Second question should be on your screen now. Are you a fat lamb producer or a wool producer? Shut that one down in three, two, one. So we've got a um, we've got a split there, thirty-three percent across the board. Third question on your screen now: Do you run a close operation, or do you bring stock in from other areas? Close that one in three, two, one. The results there on your screen. Um, so the majority of you do bring, bring stock in. Now getting to the topic at hand. Do you quarantine drench? drench? Yes, no, or unsure? Close that one in three, two, one. So the majority of you do quarantine drench, uh, some you don't and some are unsure. So a good mix there, Tim. 
And final question before we get into Tim's presentation. How many actives do you use as part of your quarantine drench? No, sorry, I've got to launch that one. Sorry, guys. We'll close that one in three, two, one. So the majority of you use at least uh, well, three actives, um, some four and the remainder are unsure. Great, so with that, I will pass on to Tim now to begin his presentation. Go ahead, Tim. Awesome, thanks for that, Alex. Has the presentation come up yet? It has. Yep, beautiful. Yeah, so today we're looking at discussing uh, what is involved with the whole point or the whole procedure of quarantine drenching a sheet and why we should be doing it. So, as Alex was saying, my background's mainly been in research with a particular focus on drench resistance and drench resistant control programs. So part of the best way to control drench resistant parasites is to stop them entering your, your property. And that's one of, the, one of the points of the whole quarantine exercise is to make sure that they don't get onto your farm to begin with. So drench resistant worms are not uncommon. They're pretty much everywhere. I would, would be very, unsure that there would be a, a, drink, a sheep farm in Australia that does not have some level of drench resistance. The drenches we've been using, a lot of them now have been at six to the 60s and 70s. So they've had a lot of pressure over time. So almost all farms have some type of resistance. The main thing that varies is the level of resistance because resistance is classified as when a drench does not get rid of 95% of the parasite burden there. So anything below 95% of efficacy is classified as resistant. So on one farm, Levamazole might be working at 70%. On another farm, it might be working at 20%. They've both just got resistance to Levamazole, just that one is more severe. The other thing that really varies on farms is the type of worms. Now, the big thing with the types of worms is usually the region. So in the New England region around Armdale here, we're pretty much known for Barber's pole, while Western Australia is very much known for the small brown stomach worm. In Southern Victoria and Western Victoria, you get the black scale worm and the small brown stomach worm. But the big thing is the parasites, they don't walk or anything like that. It's the, the animals that are the ones that are moving the parasites. So the big thing is, how does resistance occur? And the resistant gene or genes, depending on what type of uh, drench it is and what type of parasite, is always in the population. There's no such thing as a drench that is ever going to be 100% effective. It's exactly the same as when we're dealing with antibiotics. We're dealing with a lot of problems with antibiotics in hospitals now, with a lot of bacteria unable to be controlled by what we've been using because they slowly get resistant over time. If this, this is just a, a pure cause of biology, because it has to make sure that a generation will always survive. So even if 0.00001% survives on the first round, then it slowly starts breeding and that trait will come back through. Now, the thing is, every time we drench, we're selecting for resistance. But the hardest thing is, we need to make sure that we are drenching at the right time to get the maximum impact from that drench, but also reducing the risk of getting resistance. One of the major ways that you really get drench resistance is by underdosing. I've seen quite a few times how people will say that they've got their 40 kilo or 50 kilo use, and then you run them over the scales and the average might be 65, 70 kilos. So automatically we're selecting the, the parasites to become resistant because we're giving them a suboptimal dose. The other way you can do it is by unnecessary drenching. 
if you're drenching when there's a very, very low number of parasites in the population, you're not getting a return on that, on that, uh, the, let me start that again. You're not getting a return on the investment of drenching, but you're also ex exposing a very small population to the drench again. Now, if the population is quite small, this means there's a small amount of eggs and larvae going out of the pasture. Then if any worm survived that one, they're, they're the ones that's going to go through and they'll get picked up quicker because there's less on the pasture. The other big way you get it is once drenches start to fail, they fall off the edge of a cliff because a drench might be 100% effective, 100, 100, 99, 95, 90, 80, and then it really starts to fall off because there's more and more of those resistance parasites in the population. So every time you drench, you're selecting a lot more for them. So if we go from 60 to 50%, will take a very short period of time than what it would have taken from 95 to 85, just because of the sheer numbers. Now, these ones here all take time. This is just evolution, selection pressure. So it takes years usually. But the big thing is you can get multi-resistant worms on your farm, and I've seen it occur, within one hour, depending on the truck. Now the truck can be your biggest downfall of your whole program because once that truck brings on animals and puts them onto your paddocks, if you don't drench them out properly, they spread those worms around, you might have resistant worms you've never had before. And the other thing is you may have worms that you've never had before. You may have bought them from a region, say from here where we've got lots of barbers pole, take them down to Victoria where there's very few barbers pole, all of a sudden you've got barbers pole in your paddock. So the way I like to think of a farm is Australia is an island and we've got very, very strict customs at the airport because we don't want bad stuff coming in. And you need to do the same thing with your farm. Each farm is very much unique. It's unique in the way it's managed. It's unique in its animals. It's unique in the way it's grazed. And it's unique in the way the health program works on that farm. So every, every little farm is their own island and you want to keep them that way. So when something enters your farm, you need to be like those guys at customs at the airport. And quite topical at the moment, you look what's happening with coronavirus. Now, the first thing they did when they realised that we were having an outbreak is we go down to lockdown. We have movement restrictions. And it's pretty much the first thing that you do whenever you're trying to control any sort of disease. Look what happened with equine influenza and that sort of stuff. The first thing you do is stop animals moving. Now, that doesn't really work in a situation like we've got because we're trading animals, we're sending animals off to slaughter, we're bringing rams in. So if we can't do that, then we need to make sure that we control the worms that are coming, that are in the sheep that come onto your property. The other thing that I've been seeing as well is all of a sudden in areas of Tasmania and you know, certain parts of Victoria where they've said, we've never had liver fluke, we've never had liver fluke, and all of a sudden they end up with liver fluke. And they're going, oh my God, the parasite is moving. But the thing is, it's not the parasite that moves, it's the livestock. And that's why you end up with areas, say, in the upper end here or down in these areas of uh, Tasmania, which are not known for certain parasites, especially liver fluke is quite topical, but all of a sudden they turn up there. And it's because animals that have been infected with liver fluke have arrived on that farm and then they've shed out the eggs onto the farm. And if the snail is there, then they transmit the infection. Exactly the same with the worms. So what are we supposed to do when sheep arrive onto your farm? The biggest thing is unload them into the yards. The last thing you want to do is have the sheep arrive and you just put down the gate on the back of the truck and you run them straight out of the paddock because then you've got absolutely no control about what is being, what those animals have got in them and then just putting onto your paddock. So when they arrive into your yards, you unload them. We want to give them at least four different effective broad spectrum drench groups and broad spectrum is like the mectins, the levamazoles, the BZs, the monitandles, those are the ones. Uh, the narrow spectrum drenches are like lysantal. They're very, very narrow in the way that they only kill barbers pole and liver fluke. But if the animals get off your truck and they're very stressed from the transport, then you do not want to go down the race and start drenching them. Leave them in the yards, give them some hay, give them some water and allow them time to recover because you don't want to be putting the extra stress on those animals by handling and drenching because you may have detrimental impacts and you may even get deaths. Now, always the million dollar question is, what drench will I use or what drenches will I use? Now, <clears throat> the thing that is the biggest dictator of what drenches you will use, it depends on how long the animals are going to stay on your farm. Because some animals only come on for a short period of time, some animals are gonna stay on for a long period of time. 
So the recommendations we've been coming up with and thinking about if you've, you want a drench or drenches that have a short export slaughter interval, are the options below. So we're suggesting for worm control, a tridectin, which is a, a, mo a moxidectin, a lorazole, and a BZ, and a Startec, which is a Durquanil, and a abamectin. So you give those drenches at the same time, so you can walk up the race with one and walk back down the race with the other, but please do not mix those drenches together. Unless a drench is designed to be mixed, say a naphthalopos drench with a BZ or a lorazole, do not do any off-label mixing of drenches. I mean, the likes of uh, chemists who design these formulations do it very, very well. And we don't know how actives, if you mix them together, that aren't designed to be mixed together, how they're going to work and how they're going to hang out together and be stable and whether they're going to work. So always administer them separately. Now, if you've done the star tech and the tridectin, but if you know they're coming from an uh, area that has barbus pole that's quite bad resistance wise, then you may consider a naphthalophos trench, which is the powdered one like an, a polax or a pole vault. When you do this trench combination, your withholding period is 17 days and your ESI is 28 days. So the main uh, really good version for this one is for trade stocks. So say you might have a mob of young crossbred lambs that just need finishing off, you want to put them in for another six, seven weeks just to put them up to the final kill weight and you don't have to worry about withhold periods, this would be the ideal type of drench to use for that. So when you don't have to worry about export slaughter intervals, which is say you've brought in some, some ewes that may be pregnant or you're, you're going to put a ram over them or you've purchased some rams and just don't forget rams because whenever you bring animals in, a lot of guys say I'm closed herd but I only bring rams in, that's still bringing extra animals in. And I've seen six rams that have been not quarantined properly ruin a whole program. So the option you can use here is a tridectin and a Zolbex. So once again, the tridectin with a moxidectin, a lavamazole and a BZ, and the monopanel in, in the Zolbex, given at the same time. And if they're coming from Barbers Fall, consider that naphthalophos trench as well. So you're going to be walking up and down the race two to three times, depending on where these animals are coming from. So you've got a, a 17 day withhold period for these guys but you've got an 84 day ESI. But if you're gonna be breeding from these animals, you're gonna get them pregnant or the rams that you're gonna have for the next couple of years, it doesn't really matter. The ESI is irrelevant. So it's a really good option to use this one when you don't have the ESI to worry about. Now, the other thing that you, you need to think about is these, these sheep could be carrying liver fluke. And as I was saying before, we've seen in Tasmania and parts of Victoria where they don't have liver fluke and all of a sudden are getting liver fluke it's because the animals have been coming on that are infected. Now these things can be quite insidious. There's some lovely pictures here with the parasites sucking in the blood, all this black stuff here is the blood from the host, from the sheep or the cow. And they're quite a nasty little parasite. Once you've got them on, they're very hard to control like any other barbless pole, small brown stomach worm. But unfortunately, we've only got two drench options that are really effective against this parasite. And they are triclobendazole, which is the likes of uh, Facinex, Flucazole, or the likes of Clazana, which is uh, Clozicare, uh, Saponvo, those types of drenches. This one here, the triclobendazole, kills all stages in a susceptible population, where Clazana gets down to about six weeks of age. However, if you're going to use a triclobendazole or a Clazantal to knock out the liver fluke, you are going to extend your withhold period and your ESI. And you're going to push it out to, the ESI will go to 63 days. So if you're trying to finish off those young crossbred lambs, just be cautious if you do do that, because if the the, um, the forerunners and the, the top end of them get up to weight quicker, you still may have the ESI running on these guys. So you've done that, you've walked up and down the race three to four times, what do you do with the animals now? The big thing is leave the animals in the yards, because when you put a drench down a sheep's throat, it, doesn't, it only kills the parasites that are in the animal there the parasites are constantly shedding eggs. So we can't kill the eggs. So the eggs might be already going out the digester and out on, in the feces of the animals. We can't stop that. So we want to leave the animals for one, three days in the yards, preferably on dirt, because if any eggs are shed out, then hopefully they won't develop. But we want to make sure that they've got good feed and good water. If you do put them in a holding paddock with some grass, 
it's ideal not to graze that paddock with sheep for uh, at least three months. In hot weather, you can go three months. In cold weather, you might only, you don't have to go six months because you want to make sure that any of those eggs that have survived turn into larvae and are sitting there waiting to infect other animals will die in the pasture. Now, the other big thing is, this is where I've seen some people get it wrong because they say to themselves, I've just drenched these sheep with three or four different drenches. I know they've got very few worms in them. I'll put them on a clean paddock. But what we want to do with these new animals is put them on what we call a dirty paddock. And a dirty paddock is a paddock that has been recently grazed by the farm's own sheep. So a, a great option would be the, the sheep, the farm's lambs, the hoggets, something that usually gets wormy pretty quick. So they've been out there, they've deposited a lot of their own worms onto the pasture. So when these new animals come on, they start grazing and they'll pick up the farm's worm population there. And what this does is, is there's any parasites that have survived the drench, it dilutes out those parasites. So we're trying to push those bad ones away again. Now, after we've done that, we've pushed them out in the paddock, they're all running around on that dirty paddock. It's really, really good idea to collect some fecal samples from these guys 14 days after the drench. And we should do a fecal egg count. Because if you do a fecal egg count 14 days after you've given three or four different drenches and you still come back with a positive egg count, it means you're dealing with a very, very resistant population of worms there. And you need to be talking to your vet or your advisor or your reps very, very quickly to work out what to do with these animals. Now, the, the reason why we select 14 days is because of the life cycle of the parasite. From the time that the larvae are, on, are ingested to the time that the parasite starts laying eggs is about 21 days. So we don't want to go too far past the 21 days because then we might be getting a new infection that could be the farm's original worms, but we don't want to go too short. So we say 10 to 14 days is that lovely window period. 14 days is easy to remember if they arrived on a Friday and you drenched them all on a Friday in two Fridays time, go back and get some fecal samples. The other thing is, if you've done a, a liver fluke drench, we want to collect the sample 63 days after we've done the drench, because this will tell us whether we've knocked out the adult population and whether we've got any uh, knocked out the immatures as well, because liver fluke have got quite a long life cycle compared to a sheep, or compared to worms, where it's 21 days for worms. Liver fluke, it's about 70 to 84 days. So that's why we say, push it out to about 63 days, just to really make sure that the liver fluke branch did work. The other thing that needs to be factored in is this is gonna cost you a fair bit of money. When you're gonna be going up and down the race three times with different drenches, each one of those drenches might be a buck or two. It all adds up very, very quickly. And we're using premium drenches here because we wanna make sure we get the best control possible. So we are gonna be paying a premium. And it's gonna take time. It's not going to be just a quick run up the race, put the drench down their throat and walk away. As I said, it's two to three, two to four times up and down the race. Then you've got to take into account the feeding of the animals. You've got to have someone there who's going to put the hay out for them, clean the tribes, make sure everything's fine, make sure they haven't been stuck in the yards or something silly like that. Also, you're going to have the testing for the animals afterwards. So all of this needs to be factored in when you purchase these animals because quarantine drenching is insurance because I've seen people who have not done quarantine drenching before. They've had, we've done testing on their farm. They had pretty average resistance. We could control it quite well, but within 12 months, we saw the whole uh, worm management program fall over and we couldn't figure out why. We traced it back to six rams. So it can happen very, very quickly. So within 12 months, we had the whole program fall over in a big heap and the production losses from that were huge. And that was just from six rams entering the farm. So anytime you can take out an insurance policy that will guarantee that your worm control program will be working at its most effective, it's pretty cheap insurance. So to summarize how to do quarantine drenching and why we do it, you must assume that every animal entering on your farm has parasites and you must assume that they have parasites that you do not want. So whether it be a different type of parasite or a different level of resistance, assume that you just do not want them. And you gotta treat the animals that way. That's why we're going up and down the race two to four times, trying to get rid of these parasites. Now with sheep, we've got the other factor is, what about parasites such as lice? In a situation where you might be buying some uh, weathers, some merino weathers or some hobbits that have got nine months, 10 months wool on them, 
the farmer may have said that he bought them off and he might have ticked the box saying I treated them or they don't have to worry about that they've got no lice. But you know, they might have a very, very low level of lice infestation that you can't detect yet. But then next year after you've shorn them, if you don't treat them accordingly, the lice can blow out. So you've got to think about that as well. And any of these animals coming on with long wool, either shear them pretty quickly and put a back line or a dip or something on them, or just keep them away from your own, own flock. The other thing is cattle. We're very big on, we know a lot about resistance in sheep parasites, but with cattle, we're starting to see a fair few issues with that. And with liver fluke, cattle uh, get liver fluke, the same liver fluke as with the sheep. So you could be importing the exact same issue with your cattle as what you can with your sheep in regards to liver fluke. So always think about that. Whenever anything comes onto your farm, whether it be a sheep, a cow, a goat or whatever, make sure you treat it as if it's got everything bad. Because remember, the whole point of all of this sort of stuff is to keep your island safe. Australia is a big island and we spend squillions of dollars on keeping our borders and customs up to speed and you need to be doing the same sort of thing on your farm. Uh, that's pretty much it from me, guys. Thanks very much for listening and I'll pass it back now to Alex. All right, thanks, Tim. No, that was fantastic as usual and, um, yeah, very topical at the moment, quarantine drenching. So thank you very much for that. Um, Guys, just a reminder, if you do have any questions, please ask them now, put them in the question box provided. We do have a bit of time to question, so please do that now. Anything on quarantine, drenching, um, anything around sheep parasitology, anything you want to ask Tim, and remember we have George there as well to take your questions too. All right, before we jump into questions, or while you're writing those up, guys, uh, we do have a special promotion for, uh, we're running just for those who attend these webinars, uh, this series of webinars this year. Um, for those who do attend any Target Sheep webinar, we are giving away a $40 uh, gift card on purchases of any Tridectin 10 litre pack. Um, quickly, claims must be made within two months of the event. Uh, you can redeem your gift card by following the link on your screen, uh, entering the relevant details and attaching a proof of purchase. Uh, you will all receive an email uh, within the next 24 hours as well with information on this promotion and much more, including a best practice quarantine drench tech note um, that Tim has uh, personally developed as well, which follows, I guess, the methodology of this webinar too. All right, so with that being said, moving on to questions now. All right, Tim, first question. Um, if I only need four actives, should I be using uh, Q-Drench every time I buy in new animals? Uh, ideally, you'd be using one of the new drenches as well. So, say like the StarTech or the Zorbix. We really need to get these new actives in into the program very quickly. Uh, so, a Q drench is part of the answer, I think, but it definitely needs to be followed up with one of the, a Zorbix or a StarTech as well at the same time. Yeah, I think we found in the um, the opening poll team that the majority were using uh, three actives. Do you have any comments on on that? Yeah, that's. Probably not the, the best situation because I've seen quite a few triple actives not working. Um, so that's why we're really suggesting it's a minimum of four actives, preferably five, which is what we're really pushing with the Tridectin and the StarTech or the Tridectin and the Zolvex, just to try and get as much as we can to really try and get those bad parasites out. Because if we don't get them out when they arrive and they're on your farm, you basically, it's impossible to get rid of them. Okay, great. No, thanks, Tim. Um, next question, uh, would flucazole be a better option for fluke treatment? Yep, yep, flucazole would be better because of the BZ. The uh, oxfenazole in the flucazole helps the triclobenazole try and kill the liver fluke. So, yeah, there would be a better option than rather than a straight up triclobenazole. But just be careful with what other drenches you're using for your worms that you're not doubling up on your BZ part of the drench. Yep, true. Next question, um, can I mix different drenches uh, to allow me to go down the race only once? George, do you want to do that one? I think, Tim, you answered that in your, your, your talk. Um, definitely the newer drenches cannot be mixed. So you can only mix if it says on the label that the drenches can be mixed. Great, no, thanks George, thank you Tim. 
All right, guys, we've got two more questions here. If you do have any more, please send them through because we will we'll end the, the webinar once we get through all the questions on the screen. Uh, so the next one is, uh, can I drench with two oral drenches? Um, it's i.e. two drench guns at the same time, or should I go down the race twice? Uh, yeah, that'd be fine. If you've got the sheep's head up and you put it down, two drench guns down the throat, yeah, that'd be fine. Or you could walk up the race with one drench and turn around and come back the other way. That'll be fine. Cool. And final question I've got here, last chance, guys. Uh, if I use Q-drench, do I still need to use another active to treat liver fluke? Yes. Yep, yep. I definitely want to come in with something else. So uh, you'd want to come in with a trickle of endazole as well then, just to really try and make sure that the the um, the fluke are hit pretty hard. Seeing Clozandal can be sometimes a little bit funny in combination, so yeah. I'd definitely come in with the trickle benazole then as well. Great, thanks, Tim. Um, and that's that's all we have. Um, so yeah, thanks all um, for attending, guys. Um, this is just a second in a series of webinars we're back we're running in 2020. Um, see a full list, you can follow the link now on your screen there. Uh, or simply Google Verbac webinars. Um, the next webinar will be held on the 16th of April, and we'll talk about everything uh, about optimizing the health and productivity of your flock uh, pre-lambing. Um, here we'll address things such as the impact of stress uh, of stress that pregnancy has on a ewe, and the impact it has on parasite population on your pasture, uh, what animal health considerations you should be making pre-lambing, and how to ensure that your pre-lambing program is highly effective. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for attending today. We hope, hope you'll let out of this session. Uh, thank you, Tim and George, for your time as well. Once we close this webinar, there will be a survey that pops up. Um, please let us know, uh, give us your feedback. Again, it is anonymous. Um, any feedback would be great and help us improve these webinars um, moving forward. Keep an eye out for the, uh, the follow-up email as well with all the important information from this webinar, uh, including details on the promotion, uh, our full list of upcoming webinars, Links to past webinars, we've done a few now, so we're getting some, um, some good recorded webinars for you guys as well. Um, and you will also receive um, the best practice quarantine tech note written by, by Tim. So with all that being said, uh, thank you everyone and um, enjoy the rest of your week.